Hi everyone, this is a video about chapter 10 which is about externalities, this is a book of Gregory Mankiw, Principles of Economics. So, basically what we have worked before it was about the law of demand and supply, how the markets behaves, okay, how the markets behave uh, is what we have or we what we saw before. Now in this chapter we're going to talk about externality. So this is really interesting because unfortunately markets when we have supply and demand the markets they don't capture all the information that they have to. So in this case the invisible hand is kind of is kind of not omnipotent. So invisible hand, just the market by themselves, they cannot fix everything. So markets do many things well, but not everything. So this is the case of externalities. So uh, remember from the chapter one, which which was about the ten principles of economics, we we have talked about the government okay so the role that the government has in the market and one of these principle says government can sometimes sometimes improve market outcomes so this is what I want to talk about how externalities they are not captured by the market and how the government can reallocate in some way resources in order to arrive to better results. So, in this case, when we are talking about markets, they sometimes fail to allocate resources efficiently. So, in this sense, the government can they can do like throughout policies, they can potentially improve the market allocation. So, we have to start and we have to understand this point very clear. An externality, this arises when a person engages in an activity that influences the well-being of a bystander and yet neither pays nor receives a compensation for that effect. So what does it mean? Basically it means that uh, when when there is some transaction between um, the consumers and producers there is there are bystanders those bystanders they are not part of the markets they are outside think about people that live really close to concerts for example so obviously the market of the concerts is just about the artists that they perform there and the public that they pay for the tickets but the bystanders in this case they are people that they live close to the stadium I think that most of them they they really don't like to be close to this really noise place all people littering all the garbage all this the mess that the concert the concert produces so those are the bystanders they are not part of the market but they are affected in negative way in this case but it can be affected in positive way some of them maybe they can listen to the music and they love that so maybe it could be externality positive for these people that they they enjoy the concert and they people that they can't stand being can't can stand being there they can be like negative externality we are going to explain this more detail afterwards so we know that if the the impact of, of the, on the bystander is adverse as the concert, as I say before, all the noise, all people littering, all people shouting, so this is called negative externality. On the other side, when we have when we have the the impact of the bystanders is beneficial, this is called positive externality. So it could be the case of people that they are close to the concert but uh, they listen to the music and they enjoy it. So it could be a uh, positive ex externality. So, in the analysis of externalities, 
it's important to take into account that we pay attention not only to the consumer producer surplus as we studied before there is a third party here which is not the government the third party they are the bystanders so it is relevant the surplus of benefit of the society so as a whole this is going to be consumers producers and bystanders people that are affected because of the market okay in positive or in negative way so we have how the buyers and sellers they neglect the external effects on the actions when deciding how much produce or buy so in this case the market equilibrium is not efficient when there are externalities. As I said before, for example, in a concert, the artists that perform, people that they go inside to the stadium, they don't care between quotation marks about other people, about bystanders. So when you decide the equilibrium price and the quantities that are uh, in the market that are supplied and bought, you see how bystanders they are out of this issue they are not important for this part so in order to understand better about externalities I'm going to explain the positive and negative examples of externalities so for example a positive one so when you have like historic uh, buildings and people repair them, people paint the facades, people change the windows, people paint them. So, uh, absolutely, when you walk around there, you feel satisfaction in some way. You feel uh, like reward. Re imagine that you, you, uh, you like uh, belong to a city that the downtown is really awful. So for example, in my case in Bogota, the capital of Colombia, so the, the downtown have been transformed throughout the last years. So I have seen how the buildings they have transformed. So you walk there and you feel like better place, okay, because it's beautiful. So this is a positive externality. How come? Because people that they uh, reform the buildings they won't receive any cent any money from my part because I'm just looking them okay this is a positive externality to me okay so so for for this example you understand a little bit how why the government uh, try to compensate the effort of the um, construction companies or reformer uh, companies giving kind of subsidy so you start to understand how when there is a positive externality is good for not only from people from the market but for bystander but also for bystanders as well so when it's positive it's good for everyone so for this reason you can see how subsidies subsidies they are really encouraged in these cases now let's go to the other part let's go to the extra negative externalities so market of uh, automobiles definitely everybody knows but everybody doesn't know how much but everybody knows how is the is the bad impact to the environment with the with the cars so for this reason uh, you will see how government they make kind of taxes to gasoline which is really high in order to encourage people to use public transportation move uh, with bike okay so you see here the other case when there is a ne negative externality there are taxes because it's not good for everybody this kind of pollution so for this reason there is going to be taxes another example of negative barking dogs so when you for example you live in um in a building when there is a bark uh, a really barking dogs or really annoying dog you see how it is a negative externality because you are like you want to lie down take a nap but you cannot because you listen to uh, out of the sudden how a dog start to bark so this is a negative externality the neighbor obviously 
he or she doesn't care about that but you receive the noise okay so for this reason it's a negative externality and obviously is not uh, is neglected by the own do dog owner so for this reason local governments address this problem by making it illegal to disturb a piece so there is you you have like kind of laws the kind of rules that you have to follow in order to live in a building so you have to avoid your dog that that it is working all day. Another positive, this is about research into new technologies. So as everybody knows, for example, the giant Apple, as they developed the touch screen, so definitely another companies um, took this new invention in order to develop this touch screen to their companies. So absolutely this is considered kind of a spillover okay how technology uh, makes another competitors to create new ideas based on the uh, on the leader in this case so this is good so for this reason there are subsidies so in this case it's not kind of a subsidy but it's kind of beneficial from the government to the inventors so there is this called patent so when you have a new idea you have like um, like some years that you can take advantage of your invention and you can be like the, you have just the policy the monopoly in order to exploit the explode this idea and this is why uh, how the government incent make incentives in order to promote innovation because otherwise uh, researchers inventors they won't have um, like incentive enough in order to make inventions because once they create other people copy and they do, they cannot have the benefits of that so we are going to talk a little bit uh, about the welfare economics just a recapitulation so we are going to work uh, with the aluminium uh, market so we know as we remember we have seen the previous chapter that the demand curve of from aluminium reflects the value of aluminium to consumers how consumers perceive or how much they are willing to pay in order to consume uh, x uh, tons of aluminium so this is the willing to pay so remember there is down low downward slope basically because higher price you don't want to consume that but if it's a lower price you maybe will have more incentive to do it so in the other case we have the supply curve the supply curve it reflects the cost of producing aluminum so the height of the supply curve shows the cost of marginal solder so basically is the other case kind of an uh, the other case from the consumer side because we have a uh, upward slope when where the higher price make uh, producers put more in the market supply more and the opposite when the price is low producers they don't have uh, incentives enough in order to produce that so for this reason they don't produce or they don't put in the market high quantities so remember when there is no government basically the price adjusts to balance just for the forces of the market from the supply and demand side no more there is any there is no intervention so think about the aluminium market we have the supply it's important that we are introducing in this chapter the private private cost okay this is just the supply which is uh, the cost of the of the uh, company okay and here is the demand which is the private value so people inside the market so we have here as usual Q and P star which reflects where is like the market is empty I mean when the quantity demanded is exactly the same as the supply um, supply offered okay or the quantity supplied so here 
Remember, this is the point where there is the maximum. Uh, I mean, what is the maximum value of the consumer surplus and producer surplus? Remember that the consumer surplus this is this triangle. Remember that throughout this or along this part of the curve, there are several consumers that are willing to pay even a higher value for this good but they don't have to they have to pay just p star so this is kind of saving from the consumer side on the other side we have this triangle which is basically the the, the producer surplus there are a lot of producers that they are along this curve they 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 are willing to supply even to these prices which are lower than p star but due to the equilibrium price, they don't have to offer to these prices. They can offer to P star. So there is kind of their their kind of uh, profits. So this triangle is considered the producer surplus as a measure of the wealth uh, for of the producers and consumer surplus as the measure of welfare of consumers. So let's think about negative externalities in production. So when we are talking about production, we automatically we need to talk about supply curve. So as you know, these kind of uh, metals, this kind of high, like high industry, they produce several problems as pollution, for example, as pollution, for example. So suppose that is pretty much real, uh, aluminum factories emit pollution. So, for each unit of aluminium produced, a certain amount of smoke enters the atmosphere. So, the cost of society of producing aluminium is larger than the cost of to the aluminium producers. Why? So, remember, as we analyzed before, we have thought just about the market from the producer side. But we haven't talked thought about the bystanders, because bystanders they have to receive the pollution from the from the factories. The cost of society is larger than the than the private cost than the supply. Okay, which is the the private cost. So. For each unit of aluminium produced, the social cost includes the private cost of the aluminium producers plus the cost of bystanders adversely affected by the pollution. So remember, when there is bad, there is a bad effect, or there is a let's say something bad that affects the supply curve. Remember that the supply curve shift to the left so in this point what I want to emphasize is that with the presence of pollutions inside the production the supply curve so the total the real cost not just the private one but the real cost has to shift to the left and this gap between the private cost and the social cost this gap this spread is the like size of the externality externality so let's think about what i said graphically in order to be more clear so we have here the supply as i said before the private cost so it doesn't have or it doesn't take into account the externality we have the demand, the private value. Remember that we are talking about ne negative externality in production. So we have here the the Q market, a P market of equilibrium. So as I said before, there is the supply which is real the social cost because this private cost this is not the total cost of the society because people they have to like they have to receive all the all the all the pollution from this company so this difference this gap as i said before this is the cost of pollution this is the real cost 
So once we are incorpor incorporating or we are introducing better the social cost, we will find here the optimum Q. So we see here how the Q market is not the optimum one because this supply curve it doesn't reflect the cost of the society of pollution. So for this reason the Q optimum, optimum is going to be less than the Q market. So this is going to be the optimum, the one which uh, get together social cost with the demand. So what quantity of aluminum should be produced? It's going to be this Q optimum and it appears the social planner figure. So what does the social planner figure? Usually, uh, as a social planner, we can think about the government, which can make some way in order to move or reallocate resources from this point to this point. So this pass is going to be made by or is going to be created by the social planner. Someone who knows which is the real value of the externality and someone that can make interventions. So in some, most of the cases, it is the government. So the idea is to maximize the total surplus derived from the market. So the, the, uh, the welfare before it was this triangle and this triangle. But now, with this market, it's going to be this and this. You can think that it's lower than before. But here we are taking into account the bystanders. This is called internalized and externality. So we are uh, internalizing the externality and bystanders, they will be benefit or they will be, yes, yeah, they will receive a benefit for that. So the idea is that the planner would choose the level of aluminium production and which demand curve cross the social curve, cost curve. So this part, as I said before. So planner does not produce more than this level because the social cost of producing additional aluminium excess the value of consumers. So automatically, when w when the social planner say, okay, you can produce more than this key optimum. This is going to be a difference between the supply and the demand. So it's going to be um, automatically, there's going to be like more demand than the supply of this part. It's going to be like um, a scarcity from the demand part, okay? Because it is not attended by the supply. So in this case, it's going to be this, okay? The optimum one. So continue uh, talking about the negative externalities in production. So there are different ways in order to reallocate resources in order to arrive to the optimum. Okay, so one way to reach this optimum is to tax aluminium. So remember that when you tax some good automatically um, it doesn't matter if it's the producers or the consumers because it's going to be a split. Uh, by them depending on the elasticity okay so in this case what we have here is like the tax would shift the supply core for aluminium upward by the size of the tax getting closer to the social cost so the use of this tax is called internalizing the externality so we are trying to make uh, the company that it doesn't neglect the presence of the the externality because kind of hurt them a little bit. So when they internalize automatically, they in this case they have to pay something to pollute. So they cannot produce as before because they have to pay for that. So for this reason, they will they will take into account the the price that they have to pay for each ton produced before of polluting. So now we're going to talk about the other case, the positive externalities in production. So 
in this case the social cost is less than the private cost so remember in this case the first situation as we analyzed before in the previous chapters it was just about the private cost now in externalities we take into account the bystanders so it means the social cost in the example before we saw how the social uh, the social cost was higher so for this reason it's better to put a tax in this case you will see how the social cost is lower so in this case it's, uh, it's in the right so it would be better to subsidize in order to to maximize the wealth for not only for consumers and, supply and suppliers or producers uh, but also for the bystanders so ex externality benefits bystanders as an example we will work with industrial robots so remember when there is a technological advance they act as a spillover so maybe some companies they can uh, copy or they can have new ideas in order to develop their uh, own robots so imagine that there is a new design that benefits not only the firm but also the society so this is called as I said before a technology spillover so we are going to talk about this technology spillover and the social optimum so we have here the social cost as usual and we have the demand is the private uh, so here let me think better okay so here is the uh sorry this is uh this is not complete okay why because this one the supply private cost is this one okay and the social cost is this one so it's like upside down so it's going to be social cost is going to be around here so here we s you see here how different from the previous case the social cost is is uh, lower than this private cost so the optimum this one is going to be the value of the technology spillover so this one is going to be optimum quantities so this is really interesting because as we saw before the robot uh, the robots market the price was this one the quantity was this one but if we make in some way internalize this uh, this um, positive externality it would be a lower price and a more quantities into the market so for this reason uh, positive externalities they have to be incentive and how government incentive them usually by subsidies so here we have the optimum so in this case again the the role or the figure of the social planner social planner uh, would choose uh, to produce a larger quantity of robots than the private market does. So government uh, can internalize the externality by subsidi subsidizing, uh, subs subsidizing, subsidizing sorry, the production of robots. So here, to ensure that a market equilibrium equals the social optimum, the subsidy should equal the value of technology spillover. So it has to be this gap, this difference has to be reached by a subsidy from the government side. So we already talked about positive and negative uh, externalities from the producer side. Now we're going to talk about externalities in consumption. So, as for example, consumption of alcohol. So you know how people who drive when they are drunk, they are likely to cause accidents. So definitely this is going to be a negative externality because no one can internalize your driving at 2 a.m. but you haven't uh, you haven't drank anything any alcohol beverage but it's someone who is completely drunk and crash on you and you die and you have some problems and definitely this is a negative externality in consumption of alcohol on the other side we have the positive one we have the consumption in education so we know as more educated population leads uh, to better governments when people is more educated we can have more progress and we can uh, finish to a better government so we have here as example we're going to summarize both in the same slide so we have here the demand private value and here we we need to move the demand because we are talking about consumption externalities so as a negative externality 
the real cost or the real demand should be this one okay so in this case this is going to be the quantity optimum okay so a negative externality as alcohol so for this reason there are several several um, punishment for people that they drive uh, drunk so this is going to be tax remember when it's a negative externality there are going to be taxes and whether it's a positive it's going to be subsidies in the other case we have here the education for example the demand but the real demand of education is going to be this one okay so this one is going to be the social value so the price is going to be higher and the quantity is going to be higher so in this case it's going to be sponsorized in some way by uh, subsidies to education so externalities in consumption so with a negative externality social value is less than the private value as we saw before social optimal quantity is smaller than the quantity determined by the private market so as we saw before the the demand is like here this one so the the quantities are lower uh, in this case uh, are, are um, the social value is lower what people really want is lower people uh, consumer alcohol than the market decide okay so this is the case so when it's a positive consumption social value is greater than the private value and the social optimal quantity is greater than the quantity determined by the private market so as we saw before the quantity determined by the private market is lower than what people really want people in society in general want more quantity of education so here the government can correct the market failure by inducing market to internalize the externality so how uh, does the government do that so to move the market to equilibrium or to optimum better is necessary a tax for negative and a subsidy for positive so negative externalities in production of consumptions led markets to produce larger quantity than is social or desirable so more pollution more alcohol and positive externalities in production or, uh, or consumption leads markets to produce more quantity than social desirable so as for example the, um, the education or the restore of buildings for example so in this case to internalize the problem the government can internalize the externality by taking goods that have negative externalities that by taxing okay and subsidizing goods that have positive externalities so how the private solution to externalities so before we saw a little bit how the government they can arrange in some way and reallocate resources but the government is not the unique uh, party uh, or the unique solution to externalities because public and private solutions want to reallocate resources to social optimum so not only government can provide solutions private can do it as well so some solutions are reached by m with moral codes and social sanctions so for example think about why most people don't litter so you don't litter actually if you are part of these people that think like that you don't litter because maybe you're going to be punished by punished by someone no basically you don't litter because you know that is bad that is not good is not is not moral and someone can judge you and ju not only that but you feel bad littering the street because uh, it's going to be bad for the environment it's going to be bad looking and maybe this is going to block the the places where the water goes and maybe it can be a cause of floods so for this reason you don't litter you don't litter but most people don't litter because it, it's wrong thing to do you know but or another thing or the golden rule do unto others as you would have them to do unto you unto you so you don't make like hurt someone because you don't like that someone hurts you so for this reason this is like a solution of externalities this is the how people can bridge so 
at other parts could be for example a non-profit organizations they receive funds to protect to protect for example the environment so maybe there are some problems but there is a third party that takes care of that but uh, this is they are not inside of the market but private uh, like people donate some resources in order to make someone uh, who take care from the environment in some way so sometimes between the same markets they can help them each other so we can just like uh, arrive to an agreement and it will be okay for example if we have an apple grower and a beekeeper and think about they are located next to each other they are probably they are just like together so when you have pollinating the flowers on the trees the bees use the nectar they get from the apple trees to produce honey so then when they internalize both produce more they can eventually sign a contract well what does it mean imagine that you don't care about the beekeeper from the other your neighbor and the beekeeper uh, doesn't care about the apple grower so they produce x quantities of apples and they raise x quantities of bees but if they make an agreement they can even produce more because more flowers they can be pulling a uh, pollinator and there's going to be more apples and more bees so this, this is going to be how people private people they can get to an agreement so for this reason we are going to start to talk about the cost theorem so in this case if private parties can bargain without cost over the allocation of resources they can solve the problem of externalities on their own so beekeeper apple grower grower they can talk together and they they can achieve better results so in the other case let's think about a person who has a dog which this dog barks and disturbs the neighbor so naturally the owner dog is happy because he or she owns the dog but the neighbor is not as happy as the other one so this is a negative externality so what is the solution so let's think about the solution social efficient so imagine that there is a social planner with two alternatives compared from one side the social planner compares the benefit of owner dog and the benefit of the neighbor or the let's say not the benefits but the prejudice of the neighbor so if the benefit exceeds the cost of the neighbor it is efficient for owner dog to keep the pet if the cost is higher than the benefit owner dog has to get rid of it get rid of the dog so according to the cost theorem, neighbor can offer to pay owner dog to get rid of it. So just owner dog will accept if the benefit is higher than the benefit of keeping his dog. So for example, the neighbor he can't stand listening the dog. So he or she talks to the other one respect respectfully and says okay man I don't like your dog but I will pay you two bucks two hundred bucks in order for you to get rid of it okay so just the owner dog will take this money just in the case that this money received is higher than the benefit that the benefit is received by the by the dog okay so they have to bargain over the price and they can reach an agreement so in this case suppose that two parties two parties are trying to reach an agreement so from one side the owner dog has a benefit of $500 so this is the benefit the, I, th I know that this is like assumption It's really hard to measure everything in money but this is going to be let's assume that is possible that you can say okay owner the dog is my benefit of 500 and the neighbor the cost is eighty hundred dollars 
So, as you notice, there is opportunity to be better off from both sides. Why? Because the neighbor, for example, can offer him 600, so it could be kind of benefit of two, uh, of, of 200, because the cost of losing the, the beauty dog is 800. And the, in the other case, the in this case, the both parties are better off, an efficient outcome is rich. But there could be another point. Imagine that the cost price is lower than the benefit. So in this case, the owner basically keep the dog and those results are still efficient because for the neighbor it's not a good idea to pay more than the cost of leasing the dog. So it's interesting that before or when we are talking about this case, we are assuming that the owner dog has the right to keep it. So what about if the neighbor has the legal right to peace and quiet? So in this there is a new role. There are distribution of the rights is relevant because it depends on who has the, the, the right okay so in this it determines who has to pay to who so whether uh, owner dog or a neighbor has the right of barking uh, uh, of the barking and a uh, dog and peace and quiet respectively so it, defi it defines who pays to whom so if the guy has the legal right to keep the dog they have to receive money from the neighbor but if the neighbor has the legal right to peace and quiet the owner of the dog have to pay something to him in order to keep the dog so this is the important conclusion of the cause theorem so private economic actors can solve the problems of externalities among themselves so they don't need a third party to solve the problem. Whatever the initial distribution of rights, the interest parties can always reach a bargain in which everyone is better off and the outcome is efficient. By, but why private solutions do not, do not always work? It's not as easy, easy as the situation before. Because this is really common how private actors on their own they often fail to resolve or to solve the problems caused by externalities. So the case cause theorem only apply when interested parties have no trouble reaching and enforcing an agreement. When there is trouble, when you go to the owner of the dog and say, please shut up this dog, and the other say, I don't care, and I'm going to still keep the dog, and there is not any agreement, and actually the dog start to bark even louder, uh, uh, like louder. So this is going to be impossible, the cost theorem. And actually, you can think about transactional costs. So sometimes the cost of the potter the parties incurring the process of agreeing to following through on a bargain. So, for example, imagine that you have to go to talk with the guy, the guy doesn't answer, you don't have time, you have stuff, you have really a lot of things to do, so it's impossible. So, as, uh, as, as an example, let's think about different languages. So, lawyers, um, uh, different languages, so you have to assume the cost of maybe an interpreter, just later, so you don't say, okay, I don't want to talk with this guy because we have different languages, we have different cultures, it's so hard to communicate each other, so this is going to be transactional cost. And in this case, when the private does not, does not reach any bargain, so government play a role. So there are like basically two two points how the government they can intervene in the market. So the first one is the command and control policies which they regulate behavior directly. So government basically say to the owner of the dog, say sorry you cannot uh, you cannot keep the dog 
if the um, the dog continues to work every all day on the or the other solution from the government could be the market based policies which provide incentives so that private decisions markets will choose the problem on their own so we are still talking about regulation so these common and country policies they are called regulations so it's how the market based policies provide incentives so that private decision market will choose to solve the problem their own so government through regulation they can make some behaviors required or forbidden so as an example it, it, it is a crime to dump poisonous chemicals into a water supply so the external costs to society far exceed the benefit to polluter so remember the social cost is shift to the left to the to the, to the private supply so in this case the government institutes a common and counter policy which means which means regulate that prohibits the, this act altogether in practice, this situation is not as simple. You cannot avoid all pollution. Sometimes the regulation has to be based on different analysis. You cannot go to a company and say, okay, you cannot pollute, and the company is closed. This is not like as easy as that. So, for this reason, we, we have another point where the government can uh, use is the Pigavian taxes and subsidies. So government can do another intervention, so different from regulation. They can internalize externality taking activities that are negative externalities and subsidize positive externalities in order to reallocate resources and in order to arrive to the optimum. So the taxes enacted to correct the effects of negative externalities, they are called Pigovin taxes. Why? Because after economics act or Pigo uh, propose this kind of mechanism to eliminate externality. So as an example, suppose the two factories, a paper mill and a steel mill, okay, a producer of paper and a producer of steel. Imagine that are each uh, dumping 500 tons of globe, okay, this kind of the waste of the production from paper or steel into a river each year. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, decides that it wants to reduce the amount of pollution. So it considers two solutions. First, with regulation, as we saw before. So the regulation could be like the EPA, okay, could tell each factory to reduce its pollution to 300 tons of globe per year. Or the Pigovin tax that the EPA could divide on uh, a tax on each factory of five fifty thousand dollars for each ton of globe it emits. So here, both uh, policies they are addressed to eliminate or reduce the externality of the waste of globe, but one is different than the other one. The first one they are fixing the quantity uh, that you can pollute or you can produce and the order um, make automatically a fine or a tax of five fifty thousand for each ton of globe it emits so the great question which solution is better so um, there is no like economics there is no uh, absolute truth but most economists would prefer the tax because the higher tax there is going to be the larger reduction in pollution uh, the tax reduces more efficiently the level of, per of pollution on the other case you have to think about in the market analysis before we saw how the taxes they distort incentives uh, and move allocation of resources away from the social optimum but in ch in with externalities is another history because with externalities society also cares about the well-being of the bystanders who are affected so they they maybe they lose some quantities um, prices or there's going to be some 
loss of consumer and producer surplus, but it's kind of transfer to the bystanders, bystanders that, that they were neglected before. So Pigavin taxes correct incentives for the presence of externalities and thereby move the allocation of resources closer to the social optimum. Remember, taxes for positive for negative externalities and subsidies for positive externalities. So in this there is a new market because we can think about tradable pollution permits. So how does it work? So imagine that the EPA they adopt the regulation of a limit of 300 uh, tons of gold per year and there are two companies this paper and the and the steel mill so they make uh, they have a proposal so they talk each other so the steel mill wants to inc increase its emission of globe by 100 tons and the other case the paper mill has agreed to reduce its emission by the same amount if the steel mill pays it five million dollars so should the EPA allow the two factories to make this deal so this thing you see how the producers in this market they can start to talk so in this case there is kind of a new market the new market of the tradable pollution permits so from the standpoint of economic efficiency allowing the deal is a good policy because uh, there's going to be still this there is not going to be violated uh, the maximum quantity of 300 tons and instead of that the it could be like the opportunity cost from the company that is going to reduce the the production is higher receiving these five million dollars so the deal must make the owners of the two factories better off because they are voluntary agreeing on it and this deal doesn't have any external effects because the quantity of pollution is still the same as the maximum permitted so but in this case we have created a new market this new market this new scarce resource is called pollution permits because there is a price for polluting so with pigavin taxes pollution firms must pay a tax to the government with pollution permits pollution firms must pay to buy the permit to the other company so this is the difference and the result the cost of polluting is what they could have received by selling these permits. So here we have the graph how the Pigovian and the demand. So this is the Pigovian tax. So this one is no more the demand of the um, pollution, but this is the demand for pollution rights. If the pollution rights, the price is lower, is lower, so it means that companies they pollute more and the equilibrium is this one to this pigovian tax the quantity of pollution to be this one okay and in the other case when we are talking about pollution permits we know that the supply of pollution permits is fixed because there is just a maximum quantity of pollution so this is going to be supply and the demand is going to be this one and this price of this market is going to be the, the um, equivalent to the Pigovian tax. Okay, so what is the objection to the economic analysis of production? So it's normal that some people don't agree that it's enough to put price for the contamination. So it means if you have money, you can pollute. So this is the main objection. This is not. It doesn't matter the efficiency, it doesn't matter the optimal. What we are doing is that we are uh, running out our planet. But as we know, there is kind of a trade off because trying to eliminate all pollution would reverse many of technological advances that allow us to enjoy high standard of living. So I guess that even some env environmentalists or some people that are. Uh, that they are uh, against the technological advance they have some uh, like facilities so in this sense it's not like efficient to have complete clean there is kind of a trade-off so this is basically 
that I wanted to say in this chapter. So I hope it has worth, I hope you can grasp a little bit the idea, and we will see in the next video that we are solving all the problems of the chapter. Have a great day, great night, continue with economics, great success. Bye bye.